Hello. Uh, my name is Kostis Maglaris. I'm the Dean of uh, Columbia Business School, and it's an extreme pleasure to be welcoming you today in uh, the inaugural Roger Mary Lecture, uh, a new lecture that uh, marks the beginning of the academic year at the Helpern Center of Graham and Dodd Investing. And I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to say uh, a few words before I pass it uh, on to the main uh, feature of our uh, lecture. But uh, Roger Mary Lecture was created this year to really honor the legacy of, uh, of Roger, who was a, a, a truly a key figure in the history of value investing in the school. And, but before reflecting on uh, Professor Mary's uh, legacy and life, uh, I wanted to really talk about the lecture itself and what we hope for. In particular, we want this to become uh, an opportunity for our entire community and alumni and friends to come together once a year to hear from academics and pr practitioners. Many of them are our alums themselves, not only uh, about the state of value investing, but also about uh, things that are happening uh, in financial markets. Uh, this year has shown uh, in a striking uh, way uh, that we live in periods of volatility, times of distress and opportunity. Uh, so it's more important than ever for us to be able to come together and really marshal the enormous intellectual firepower that we have in our community and make sense of these times. And I want to uh, go back to uh, my predecessor and friend, uh, Glenn Hubbard, who always spoke about bridging theory and practice. And we truly remain committed to this idea and this venue and these uh, events like this are ways for us to come together debate and think together about practical issues uh, of importance. The lecture in particular honors Roger Mary, who was instrumental in the continuation of the value investing tradition here at the school. Uh, after Ben Graham retired from teaching the security analysis course in 1956, David Dodd stayed for a few more years until his retirement in 61, and Roger Mary was the one to carry it the value investing uh, torch, uh, so to speak, in Columbia Business School for well over two decades. Um, only two years after uh, Graham's retirement, Mary was appointed to the first uh, S. Sloan Cole Professorship of Banking, a chair that he held at, until 1965, where he taught security analysis courses, capital markets courses, and for, uh, things in uh, courses in portfolio management. From 65 to 1970, Mary left the university. He continued to teach as an adjunct, but he worked as full time as an executive vice president and portfolio manager at the College Retirement Equity Fund. He came back in 1970 as a full professor and retook the Sloan Cole professorship. Now, Roger Mary really epitomizes the values of what I was talking about before bridging theory and practice. He, before he joined the school, he had a 20 year successful career at Bankers Trust as an investment manager, chief economist, and vice president until his retirement in 1955. This was of course our school's lucky break because he happened to be retiring right when uh, Ben Graham was in his last years at the school uh, and overlapped with David Dodd for a few more years. And in particular, Roger Mary was a distinguished academic, a person that had uh, a strong uh, and uh, sort of uh, broad uh, experience in industry. And he brought it all together when he uh, came back to the school. He has also written uh, uh, extensively. Uh, his publications, Journal of Finance and the Financial Analyst Journal, make for uh, interesting, profitable reading even today. Uh, he, in 1964, he was honored by the finance uh, profession, the academic profession, as making him the president of the American Finance Association. So in the middle of all of this, uh, he also had a tremendous impact in policy. Uh, as some of you know, Roger was an expert uh, witness in many congressional committees, and his papers were instrumental in the passage of the Keogh Act in 1962. Uh, and a lot of uh, changes in the retirement plans of self-employed and small businesses and the creation of the IRA, the Individual Retirement Account. So he was uh, truly an extraordinary man and a key part of the school's history. Uh, and we're really honored and pleased uh, for this lecture to be named after him. Now, with all of that, uh, I cannot think of a better inaugural Roger Mary lecture 
than having Bruce Greenwald uh, join the conversation. Bruce picked up where Roger Mary left off by founding, with the generous support of the Helbrun family, the Helbrun Center for Graham Adol Investing, the Value Investing Center, uh, as our students call it. And under his leadership, the center really has become the leading uh, value investing teaching institution in the world with an unmatched curriculum and faculty. Uh, Bruce is, of course, an academic of enormous distinction, intellectual breadth, uh, powerhouse uh, in the school, uh, and also, as uh, a lot of us know, a phenomenally impossible debater. Uh, so, Tano, I wish you good luck uh, today. Uh, the thing about Bruce is that his views are, are different. Uh, they're always strong, uh, and they always hit you with unexpected uh, and interesting insights. Uh, so even though Bruce retired uh, a year ago, he remains a phenomenal presence in our community, and we are delighted that he has agreed to be the inaugural speaker for the Roger Mary Lecture. Uh, and Bruce is going to sit in a conversation with my good friend, Tano Santos, the David and Elsie Todd Professor of Finance and the current faculty director of the Helbrun Center. So we have the past, the present, and the future uh, of value investing all in display in this lecture. So I cannot think of a better way of actually starting our academic year. So thank you all again for being here. So Tano, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Kostis, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And indeed, it's quite an honor to, uh, to be part of this inaugural Royal Mary Lecture. Um, and Bruce, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you and I owe a lot uh, to Roger Mary. We inherited uh, from him this marvelous uh, value investing uh, tradition. So we're going to have a fun conversation about that tradition today. Uh, but before we start, uh, you know, I want to, I, I want to, uh, you know, we have some news about the second edition of the value investing book. Uh, so why don't you share it with with uh, the crowd and uh, give us the news about what is happening with that second edition before we start, Bruce. Okay, the good news is the second edition is actually going to come out on October 10th of this year, only 17 years later than it was originally <laughs> slated to appear. So, so it will be there. Yeah, I so finally it came out. It's not available on the Amazon website. If you go to Wiley, uh, you can actually pre-order it. That's great. So it only took us 17 years to, to get the second the second edition, but we, we, we did it. We did it. So we would be, uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, so for the fall, you will be able uh, to get that second edition of the Van Investing view, uh, book. Um, very good. So uh, I want to have a, Bruce, I want to have a good conversation about Van Investing, uh, about, uh, you know, where we are as Van Investors. But I want to start with a question that inevitably comes up in every panel and round table that we have on Van Investing these days. And it's not that I want to get it out of the way, but on the contrary, well, I want to have a thorough conversation on the issue. And it is the performance of value investing over the last few years. It has come, as you know, under scrutiny, uh, value investing, as it seems that both the performance of some distinguished value investors, as well as the performance of traditional quantitative value strategies have been wanting over the last decade or so. And I, and I really want to explore this topic for you because, you know, you and I are convinced about the bright future of value investing, but we need to make sense of what has happened uh, to value investing, in particular over the last uh, decade. So why don't we start there and then we'll take it uh, in many different directions, I'm sure. So why don't we start with that one? Okay, I, in fact, this is a really good way to honor Roger because when he basically took over in 1965, he was in exactly the same situation. And I think today it is in fact for reasons that go beyond what he confronted then. So let's just get out of the way the sort of standard and I think realistic reasons why the last 10 years have not been a great 10 years. And the first is that with the exception of the interruption in the associated with the financial crisis, which turned out to be surprisingly uh, short lived, we are basically very late in a very long term uh, boom, investment, up, upward investment cycle. And characteristically value never does well late in the cycle. That's a temporary thing. I think that, you know, it, it did get reversed in the financial crisis, 
I think that inevitably that part of the situation will improve. But then there are more permanent considerations that I think you have to worry about. And the first is the contribution of Warren Buffett, which is that value investing is much more popular, especially in the United States, but certainly around the world too, than it ever was before. I mean, basically you're competing with a lot more value practitioners and people have seen the effect of that. I mean, if you look at Joel Greenblatt's book about spinoffs, that was an area that he was a specialist in alone. That's now a heavily populated area and the returns have not been what they had historically been. Same thing has happened with bankruptcy and distress debt. Same thing has happened uh, with microcap. So one of the things that value investors are gonna have to adapt to is the population explosion which is when I was a kid, there were two and a half million people on the planet. Now there are seven and a half and a similar population explosion has occurred in value investing and we're gonna to have to adapt to it. But I think actually there is another fundamental economic and technological trend that is not going away that has in fact undermined the advantage of value investing not in sort of the fundamental senses I hope we're going to talk about, but certainly in sort of the traditional ways of approaching it as low market to book, low price earnings ratio stock. And that is this. Uh, if you look at the U.S. economy from 1946 at the end of the war to 1986, the return on capital in business diminishes steadily. I mean, that's really actually the start of the globalization trend. So the companies like General Motors, like IBM, that at the beginning of that period, even Ford, have deeply entrenched, protected essentially monopolies or oligopolies. By the end of that period, they are subject to competition. One of the things that that means is that if people count on growth to generate value, in an increasingly competitive market, growth generates less and less value. Yeah. So for example, if you don't earn more than the cost of capital on your growth investments, growth has no value at all. So as those returns on business capital diminish, the value of growth diminish. And that meant that value investors who following Ben Graham and Roger Murray and uh, Warren Buffett you know, basically were very careful about investing in growth. They had a natural advantage because for a 40 year period, growth returns were disappointing. And the most dramatic uh, period in which you see that happen is the absolute devastation of the nifty 50 stocks sort of starting from the early 70s on where that was essentially a growth investing strategy that completely cratered. That trend, it seems to me, is reversed for a very fundamental reason. If you look at the structure of the economy, we, have, we are moving and have moved from manufacturing, which is a big globally competitive industry, natural resources, which is a big globally competitive industry, the axons and the General Motors of the world, to what are essentially local service businesses. And service businesses like Walmart produce output that's locally produced and consumed. That means that markets for the purposes of competition are local markets. Local markets are small markets. Small markets can be dominated by particular competitors, which means you're erecting barriers to entry, which means that you're increasing returns on capital. And we've seen that in the data since roughly the late 80s, but middle of the late 80s. And that means that growth is much more valuable. And that's a trend that's not going away. And it's a trend that's also, by the way, been enhanced by the direction of technology. Technology is increasingly deployable in niche markets. It's Salesforce these days, not even general software like Microsoft. And that means you're getting more and more of these local monopolies in product space now, not necessarily in geography, but enhanced by local monopolies in geography. And that means growth has become over the last, well, so far we're not quite at 40 years, but we're at 30, 34 years. 
has become more and more valuable. And that means that value investors who do not look at growth, who look only at sort of static metrics of value, are in big trouble. And I think we're going to have to adapt to that reality. And I think that at the same time, as you move to services and as technology changes things, that intangible capital has become more and more important. And that means that the usefulness of traditional market to book measures has been undermined, but also traditional price earnings metrics have been undermined because a lot of earnings gets basically buried and invested in increasing intangibles. So at the same time that it's basically diminished the value of a sense that we should not be investing in growth, these fundamental economic and technological trends that are not going away have undermined traditional value metrics. And frankly, and this is really what the second edition of the book is focused on, and it's why I don't really mind the 17 year delay, value investors are gonna have to adapt to this new environment. So uh, this, uh, this is very interesting. I want to build on this, but before I uh, go back with additional questions on the issue, there are already questions coming in. So the way we're going to do this is that uh, Bruce and I are going to have a conversation for the next 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for questions in the last half hour of, uh, of this event. So don't worry, you will have opportunities to ask your questions at about uh, 7.20, 7.30, give or take, Eastern time. And uh, you will be able to ask uh, your question there, you know, uh, to Bruce. So you can actually submit your questions in the Q&A um, uh, button uh, uh, in your Zoom panel, and we'll be able to read them. Uh, Mary Trivedi will read the questions to us. So Bruce, I want to summarize a little bit what you said, because I, I like very much this structural implication about what is going on with value. That Let me repeat it back to you so we can fix ideas. You know, that somehow... Uh, the kind of uh, barriers to entry that the companies enjoyed, the growth companies of the 50s and 60s enjoyed were gradually eroded by global competition. And as a result, uh, they had produced a very poor performance of growth relative to value. Uh, and thus this kind of value premium that we have seen, uh, um, you know, until uh, the last decade. And that now the this structural change that we're witnessing towards a service economy is coming with powerful bias to entry to local businesses, to services, which have more powerful bias to entry. Uh, slowly investors are recognizing the bias to entry associated with the service sector. And thus the kind of uh, price uh, appreciation that we're seeing uh, in the um, growth segment of the market and thus uh, the uh, strong uh, returns of growth uh, strategies relative to value over the last few years. Did I get the story more That's or less right or not? Right. And I, the way I would say the growth segment is it's the franchise business segment. There yeah. are a lot more franchise businesses. Out exactly. There. So, and can we talk a little bit about, so I get completely the point about, about uh, these local uh, economies of scale that uh, service uh, companies enjoy, uh, you know, and just simply because I know this is very high up in the mind of many investors today, kind of the role of some of these big tech companies like the Facebooks and the Googles, these companies that enjoy also some bias to entry associated with some type of network externality in the case of fe Facebook, because they, there are some natural uh, increasing returns in searches associated with Google and so on and so forth. That's another kind of source of a bias to entry benefit in some big tech. But you have always been a little bit more skeptical about that because if I have learned anything uh, from you over the years is that you kind of have a lot of faith in the process of innovation to overcome uh, the bias to entry that are protecting outsized profits. So is that a fair uh, I, I, look, I think it's fair, but I think you have to look at where those barriers to entry are right. and therefore right. how sustainable they are. Now, right. the first thing about the tech companies is that if you look at Google and Microsoft, they are very specialized. I mean, if you compare to the old IBM that did everything right. or the old uh, you know, RCA going back further that did everything and General Electric that did everything, you know, Microsoft originally only did operating systems. 
and they kind of did a Walmart strategy expanding at the edge of operating systems. And when they decide that they're geniuses and try and do Xbox, they lose a lot of money. Right. That if you look at Google, you have exactly the same story. They do search and they do search unbelievably well. They focus on that narrow market, that one function of the internet. They completely dominate it. They get better and better at it because we all use Google. And they make a ton of money in that and that's not going away because they're very specialized. But when they try and do all this other stuff, driverless cars and so on, doesn't do them any good. So right. people have to understand where the barriers are. And I think that there are in these tech companies uh, opportunities so that Amazon has a internet face to its customers that's going to be easy to replicate. And I think what they've been smart enough to understand is that their business has two components. One is the internet interface, which is global essentially. But the second is local distribution. And if they can get local distribution, which is what they spent a ton of money on, they will be fine, although if they're going to have a tough time in that area competing with local Walmarts and so on. But that's at least an area where the network effect is reinforced by local economies of scale. On the other hand, I think Apple is going to be in real trouble in the long run. So I think it's very important to understand area by area which of these big tech monopolies are sustainable because there is a specialized local market presence behind them, either in product space or in uh, geography, and which of them like Apple or not. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right that you have to understand these companies case by case and really identify what is the source of customer captivity that is making this or that company uh, a profit machine. And what is fascinating about Amazon is, well, this is kind of a, a, an internet company that is discovering the need of actually building the local distribution networks in order to capture those local markets in a traditional uh, retail strategy uh, that we've seen time and over again. And let's see whether they can succeed because as you very well pointed out, you will end up competing with uh, distribution behemoths, the likes of uh, like uh, a Walmart and other retailers. So let me bring you then to the, I, I want to explore more, you know, this is a lecture of, after all, uh, Bruce, and uh, you know, I want to explore the issue of growth a little bit more uh, deeply. Um, and, you know, how to actually operationalize this. So, you know, how do you think about, you know, uh, you know, traditionally value investors would look at the value of a particular security, they would calculate a fundamental value, and if there's a margin of safety, well, we go, and, and take a position on that company. Oh, okay. How do you think about growth in that context? Okay, let me talk actually a little more generally first and then come back and answer your question. Yeah. I think the key to, su to successful adaptation to this new environment is not to abandon fundamental value principles. Absolutely. So I think the first thing it will be useful to do is just review what those are. And I think there are three that you know, are pioneered by Ben Graham that <laughs> don't go away, even though we're going to have to apply them in different ways. So the first, I think, is that value investors have always understood that you have to look for an area in the market for opportunities where you have an edge, where you're sort of the only person who's looking sensibly at these opportunities. Now, in Ben Graham's day, that was really easy. All he did was he did serious security analysis that nobody else did. And that gave right. him the edge right. uh, as long as there was data available to do that, which he started with railroads because that data was available at the ICC and nobody else had it. From there, we moved on to what I think is still uh, an existing advantage, but is much uh, attenuated, uh, which is just the behavioral finance advantage, that people just oversell ugly, obscure, and therefore cheap stocks, and they overbuy glamorous lottery ticket stocks. And that's right. deeply embedded in human behavior. And it is an element, although not an explicit element early on, in what Graham does. And that's still there today. You don't want to throw that away. But I think given how heavily populated the value community is today, you've got to continue to look for an edge that'll put you on the right side of the trade, where you can say, okay, I'm doing this. There are not a lot of people doing the competition in the same way as me. 
And I think that uh, that's going to enable me more often than not to be when I sell on the right side of that trade than when I buy on the right side of that trade. And and this is in the book. I think increasingly what that's going to mean is you have to be specialized. Right. You cannot be a generalist. You can't, you know, fly down to Texas and trade oil leases with a guy who has spent his whole life doing onshore South Texas Gulf oil leases, and that's all he trades because you're going to get slaughtered in that. And specialties are going to be geographic and they're going to be by industry. So I think the first thing very much in the Ben Graham, Roger Murray tradition is that you still have to look for an edge. And increasingly, that's going to mean being specialized. I think the second element of value investing, which is I think really what you spoke to, is you got to know what you're buying. You have to know what you're buying is worth. And that's really where the value comes in. As I say, for Graham in the 20s and 30s, that was just doing fundamental research that nobody else was doing until Graham in his own public spirited self undermining way establishes the New York Society of Security Analysts, teaches everybody to do that. Right. More recently, I think the advantage has been that the Graham and Dot approach to valuation has been superior to the alternative. And that approach has been asset value, which is often overlooked by most investors, a carefully formulated earnings power value, sustainable earnings, not just current year earnings. And forgetting about growth, which is really very hard to forecast and is in the far distant future. And that's a lot better in many, many ways than a DCF or a ratio valuation. And I think that you still want to do that where growth doesn't matter. Right. So that if you're talking about investing in competitive businesses, if you're talking about investing in real estate or natural resources that are inherently competitive businesses, what you're going to want to do in that case is the asset value, earnings power value. With this exception, you're going to have to address the issue of intangibles both on the balance sheet and the income statement. And we worry a lot about that in this edition and how to do that well of the, of the book. But I, I, think, can I, you, I think this is really important in a way and that people that in a way and connects daily to the question that you were answering uh, before on this issue of how intangibles are becoming more important in today's economy. And that, uh, you know, this is something that we do a lot of work with the students on how to actually calculate the value of these intangibles how to calculate how these investment in intangibles flows through the income statement. And this is an important point to hammer uh, with, uh, with, uh, with everyone, that that's going to play an increasing role uh, in valuation uh, going forward. And so as you do it, by the way, kind of what I would stress is the value principle of start with the balance sheet. Yes. So absolutely. list those intangibles on the balance sheet. Look at the reproduction costs and try and incorporate that reproduction cost in the asset value you're buying. Yeah. And that's just thinking through the R&D cost or the customer acquisition cost or whatever. Absolutely. In the process of doing that, you're going to isolate the effects of the investment in those intangibles, which is going to enable you to do the appropriate adjustments to the income statement. So I think, again, you don't want to abandon the fundamentally valuable uh, you know, Graham and Dodd Murray approaches. Um, so I think, yes, that's, a, uh, that's something you want to do in detail and you want to start with the balance sheet. But the other thing is that franchise profits are inherently intangible. Franchise value is intangible. It's not something that appears on the balance sheet. It's not something that actually appears as a separate item on the income statement. You've got to infer it from histories of these companies. So I think that in a sense, what you've got to look at when you look at the Graham and Dodd principle of knowing what you're buying, I think the big change has been that for different kinds of investment opportunities, you've got to use different valuation approaches. So if you're talking about fixed income with well-defined payoffs, where the issues are arbitrage, where the issues are relatively short-term in timing, go ahead and use a DCF. 
Absolutely. You're talking about competitive businesses, real estate, natural resources, asset value, earnings power value adapted to account for intangibles. If you're talking about franchise businesses, which are the only businesses for which growth generates value, then what you have to do, it turns out, because a lot of the payoffs are way out in the far distant future, and they're very hard to measure in dollar terms, you've got to actually calculate returns. You've got to ask the question, if I buy this at today's price, what kind of a return am I going to earn? Because that is a number that's reasonably calculable. If you ask yourself, what is this worth? I think you're just going to be producing a phantom calculation and you're going to be dreaming. And so this the is crucial because step here is calculating right. return. Sorry, go ahead, Anna. And then, you know, I want you to elaborate a little bit on this, on why is it that when the issue is growth, the DCF method is so imprecise? I mean, this is a, another important lesson that many uh, people are not aware of. So can you elaborate a little oh, okay. bit on this so, kind of how convexity kills you in a way? Okay, here's, here's the problem. There are a lot of problems with the DCF method. One, they ignore the balance sheet. It's not a good thing to ignore important data. It's not going to put you on the right side of the trade. But much more importantly, if you think about what you do with a DCF, you estimate near-term cash flows and the value of those cash flows appropriately by appropriately discounting. And then you have to estimate far distant cash flows because that's an important part of what you're buying. And the problem with the far distant cash flows is that you have really very large errors when you estimate those because they're far out in the distant future. Typically, they get buried in the terminal value. And the terminal value has these huge errors. And then what you do is you take your value related to the near-term cash flow and your values related to the distant cash flows, and you add them together. And when you add bad information to good information, the bad information dominates. Right. And that's what you're doing in a DCF. But when you look at a return, you are actually focusing on a trajectory. And you're projecting that trajectory from today. And you're not looking at changes in that trajectory. The best you're going to do, and typically the way you estimate these returns, is assuming that trajectory is unchanging. Constant growth rate, constant profit rates, and so on. That's the essence, by the way, of what you're doing with uh, terminal value. Right. And in the process of doing that, you're going to focus on what's there today, so you're going to be focusing inherently on the best information. And that's why you're much better off from this getting rid of the bad information and concentrating your valuation on the good information so you know what you're buying to focus on the return, not the value space. Right. And let me emphasize another point that I think is really important for our audience today, or all our friends listening to us today, which is this, there's something that I really like about value investing and that you brought up very nicely, which is this flexibility. The fact that you approach the problem of valuation in a way that is a specific to the particular economics of the firm that you're investigating to the particular circumstances. There are situations in which the asset value and the earnings power value is enough. There are situations in which even a DCF can work if you're evaluating a very sound infrastructure project and you know exactly how many people are going to be driving in that highway year after year. Or you go into the more sophisticated uh, growth calculation to which uh, we're going to turn in a minute. So that flexibility of the value investor, I think, give us uh, an enormous edge going forward that we know how to think flexibly uh, and in a way that is specific to the uh, problem at hand. And I would stress that we are constrained by this Ben Graham, David Dodd, Roger Murray principle of knowing what we're buying. Absolutely. So we don't go flexible by dreaming. We go <laughs> by focusing on where the good information is. Now, exactly. can I just briefly, so that's, so the first principle of value investing is look where you have an edge. Second principle is know what you're buying. And I think the third, which is fairly straightforward, is and hasn't changed, you have to have the discipline and the patience to wait for a decent margin of safety in values traditionally, but in returns when you evaluate these franchise businesses 
before you act. So it's looking in the right places, knowing what you're buying, having a superior valuation methodology, and just being disciplined and patient and waiting for a margin of safety. And I think if you keep those principles in mind while you extend the traditional value approaches, we will continue to be the richest investors in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more in a way that it, the discipline and the process of value investing, that, that, it, that cannot go away. It will change, it will transform, it will force us to look at different things. But value investing is, a, is an organized process of discovery of fundamental valuation and of returns. So can we talk a little bit about uh, you know, the actual mechanics of returns, uh, Bruce, can you elaborate a little bit on that okay. for, uh, for our audience? So, and again, we're going to go back to a value principle, which is when you look at anything, you want to disaggregate and look at it carefully. The balance sheet right. you want to take apart, the income statement you want to take apart. Now here, the first step before you even bother to calculate a return is to verify that there's a franchise there. Above average returns, share stability, failed entry, dominant competitors in the market in question. If those don't conditions don't exist, you're almost certainly in a competitive market. You're going to earn the cost of capital on growth. Growth is going to have no value. You're going to do asset value earnings power. So the first step here is verifying that a franchise exists. The second thing you want to do is disaggregate the return. Look at the pieces. There is a cash return that you can calculate. So sustainable earnings times the fraction of those earnings that get distributed. And that you can focus on separately. It's the most reliable piece of what you're going to get. And again, we want to look at the pieces of value and go from more to least or most to least reliable. Second thing you want to look at is organic growth that when you have barriers to entry and the market grows because people have higher incomes or there are more people, in a competitive market, all that does is generate entry. You don't make money, but in a market with barriers to entry, you get to enjoy that. So organic growth is a component of the return. And you have to look at organic growth in two ways. You have to look at the underlying drivers of it to make sure that your organic growth Estimate is consistent with the economics of income growth, with the economics of changing pace, with the economics of population growth, demographics. So can you give an example of this, uh, you know, on this whole issue of organic growth? So for instance, for a retailer such as Walmart, would same store sales be a good metric of organic growth? That's okay. So you've got, you've got direct measures like same store sales in the mature market. Right. And you want to look at those, but you also want to say, is this current measure likely to represent the future? So, you know, same right. store sales growth has been about one to 2% for years in the United yeah. States. Right. Well, if you think about it, you know, GDP growth in the United States has been about, in the Walmart territories, has been about 4%, 1.5% two, inflation, maybe 4, 3.5 to 4, maybe 2 to 2.5% two real growth. Unfortunately, Walmart's demographic is a low-income demographic and low-income demand and low-income incomes are rising much less rapidly all over the world for structural reasons also related to the trend of services. So that basically, you know, their audience or their demand is growing roughly two and a half percent less rapidly than overall demand, two to two and a half percent. Subtract that from the four percent you're at one and a half, maybe two at most, which is exactly where they've grown. But the point is, and this is what Ben Graham taught us by, you know, comparing asset values to earnings power values. You want to look at a full range of indicators and you want to triangulate among those indicators. So you've got the right. economic forces driving organic growth and you have exactly the sorts of measures that you talked about. And you want and to- Right. Can I ask you something about this, by the way? Like in many, going back a little bit to what we were discussing at the very beginning, you know, in on many occasions, you don't have these metrics. You don't have the data. Or the data is not provided to you either because the company is not providing uh, segment-based information or it just reporting it in a way in order to scramble or hide its competitive advantage from competitors. Can I, can I ask you about this? What is the role of qualitative analysis? How do you think about this? You know, when you think 
a company it has can that value to enter. You can refer that question because I'm mean, basically wait, when you use qualitative information is when you have a break even number. Right. And you say, is this qualitative information push me above the break-even number? Right. So that I, it's a good investment, or does it push me below it? So let I me defer okay. that because there's going to be okay. an area where it's very hard to calculate what's going on, and you're going to do basically qualitative analysis. So let me defer that for a second until I get there. Got it. But you know, with organic growth, remember a franchise arises when you dominate a market. Yeah. When you dominate a market, your growth rate is the growth rate in that market. So I don't care what the company tells you. If you can identify the size of that market and the growth rate of that market, you'll know what's going on, whether locally Absolutely. in geography or in the particular product niche where they're, uh, where they're competing. So I think that that's not where the big problem is. But I think the principle here of disaggregation and then triangulation which Ben Graham and David Dodd introduced us to continues to apply. Then you've got a third element of value, which is the reinvestment return. That yeah. part of the profits get reinvested and increasingly it isn't identified that part of the profits reinvested in the actual official income statement. And that generates value. In a competitive business, you earn the cost of capital on that investment and it doesn't generate value. If you reinvest $100 million, you make $100 million. But here, where you're in a franchise that if capital allocation is good, you can generate more than a dollar of value for each dollar you reinvest. And again, it's looking at that in detail and looking at two steps. The first is how much are you reinvesting? What is the intangible investment that's going on? And therefore, what are the true retained earnings that are being plowed back into the business yeah. here? And you want to start there. And then you want to apply a value creative factor, a value creation factor, if you will. If these guys are pissing it away, like Intel, trying to get into driverless cars, you can look at the acquisitions and they're basically spending a dollar for 20 cents of value, which means you're going to multiply that investment number by a fifth. Yeah. If these guys are opening new stores in their core market, like Walmart was for a long time, you could look at the economics of a new store or the economics of a super center conversion from a discount store, and you get returns on the order of one and a half, two times the cost of capital. And that means every dollar reinvested is going to generate two dollars. So there are, again, two factors you want to look at here. You want to calculate the amount reinvestment, and you want to look at the quality of capital allocation. And there you do want to do a, a qualitative check. I mean, you do want to start with the idea, are these guys good capital allocators or not? And if they're not, I guarantee you the reinvestment return is going to be just at most the amount they're reinvesting. Right. So again, you want to disaggregate, look at things in detail, and to the extent that you can triangulate their history of uh, past investment with the growth in profits, you can get your arms ideally around uh, what these reinvestment returns are. Now, the last thing that the kind of balance sheet disaggregation that you know Graham and Dodd and Murray taught us to do is you don't overlook things. And there is an element of these franchise returns that everybody overlooks. And it is that franchises don't last forever. If this is a hundred year franchise, you're still losing about seven tenths of a percent of value a year. It's fade rate of the franchise. The fade rate of the franchise. And you have Absolutely. to take that into account because you don't know when the fade is going to arrive. Right. I mean, newspapers were great until they weren't. <laughs> so it's like a, in engineering terms for Costco's purposes, it's a Poisson process. Right. It's a constant arrival rate, but you have to account for it when you buy growth. And one of the historical problems with buying growth when the franchises were disappearing was, Nobody accounted for the fade rate. Now, the problem is it's hard to do. You have to think about the future of the industry. I mean, how long is Coca-Cola going to last for? Well, it's lasted for 100 years so far. Looks like those tastes are changing a little, but not that much. But this is where I think you want to do the qualitative analysis. So you want to take the calculated return of cash, organic growth return, reinvestment return, 
compare it to your cost of capital for a margin of safety, and then say, does that margin of safety look like it's larger than a reasonable fade rate? Right. And that's the qualitative analysis, but you've got to worry about the fade rate. Second thing is once you've disaggregated things, you can apply a rule of reason. If you can't estimate an organic growth, because this thing is growing really rapidly for the time being, and we know it's not going to be 100% of the economy in the future. Right, exactly. That's just going to be too tough to call. So if you can't fill in these boxes, you're going to have to say this is too tough to call, and you're going to have to move on. Because again, value investing is about knowing what you're buying. Anytime you think that your growth rate is above 5% faster than GDP, lots of luck with that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but, but, but even this... Right. Even this comment you just made is, is, is important, right? That there's, that it, 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 there's a danger of extrapolating these rates of growth. They have nonsensical implications for how much of the economy that company is going to be or how much of that industry that company is going to be if they sustain these rates of growth. Uh, and even this simple sanity check uh, is useful uh, to avoid buying lottery tickets, uh, in my opinion. Absolutely. And again, the more disaggregated you are, I mean, look, you don't care about that growth if you're getting a 10% cash return. Yeah, absolutely. But if absolutely. you disaggregate That's... things and you're paying for a lot of growth, it's going to be cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There is one last factor about calculating these returns that everybody has ignored that you have to take into account. And it is this. The value of growth is not the same as the growth rate. The growth rate applies to intrinsic value. So if your business is growing at 6%, 4% organically, it's 4% times the current intrinsic value. You have to divide that by the market price to get the Absolutely. growth return. So the growth return is actually the growth rate times the ratio of intrinsic value to market price. And that gets away from this dividend discount model stupidity that no matter what the price is, the growth return doesn't stay the same. Yeah, this now, is absolutely. Here, yeah, yeah. No, let me just finish. Tano, and absolutely. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Here, there is a crucial principle at work. If you are earning above the cost of capital, then the intrinsic value is above the market price. So if you have a true margin of safety in the simple growth calculation you start with, then you're being conservative because the growth return is actually greater than the growth rate. But if you don't have that margin of safety, you're going to be way overestimating the value of growth. So in these growth calculations, being disciplined about a growth margin of safety that is greater than the fade rate is absolutely crucial. That's the right conservative strategy. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I wanted to emphasize this point because you and I have discussed this point uh, for many years, right? This kind of adjustment that you need to put on the growth rate, which is turns out, and the math is absolutely beautiful, uh, is kind of a ratio of... Um, uh, you know, the fundamental value to the market value, because it tells you at what price you're going to be buying that growth, and that affects the return on your investment. And that's something that if you follow kind of a standard calculations of returns, you're going to be missing completely uh, this point. And it comes out naturally when you think in a more disciplined, disaggregated way, as you put it, uh, and value, on the issue. Thinking on the issue about the value of growth, absolutely, those are just the growth rate. Yeah, absolutely. And can I put in a little plug for Roger Murray here? Absolutely. Go ahead. Of course. When, when, I, I mean, my introduction to value investing was that Mario Gabelli arranged for Roger Murray, who was then 82 years old, to give a series of value lectures that he taped. It was like an anthropologist preserving a dying language from the Amazon. <laughs> I have to give you the only of piece lectures. of paper that Roger Murray produced that he handed out in those four lectures was a dividend discount equation. And he said, you're going to have to use this if you want to evaluate growth. And it is really, really dangerous. So he implicitly understood, I think, these things that we are now in the next edition of the book explicitly identifying. So more power yeah. to Roger. 
absolutely, absolutely. No, no, wonderful insights. Those lectures are worth listening. I even have like a transcripts of that. And that, you know, they really make for wonderful, wonderful reading. I very much recommend them to, to, uh, to everyone. Uh, the guy knew what he was talking about indeed. Um, so Bruce, I want to, uh, you know, we're gonna let uh, our audience uh, uh, ask questions through Meredith shortly. But I wouldn't want to uh, finish this uh, with this, uh, this conversation without two additional questions. So what about, so, you know, the process is in place. And one of the things that one of the words that, uh, you know, uh, you and I have discussed often, and I want to have this discussion in front of everyone is the issue of risk management. And how do you think about, um, you know, the issue of, um, what kind of things in terms of risks should the investor be worried about? How do we think about managing those risks? How do we think about portfolio construction? How do we think about diversification? How do we think about those matters? Can you say some words about yeah, that? Yeah, I think, okay. So I think the first place where we both agree is you have to start with the right definition of risk. Absolutely. And the standard variance definitions are incoherent in two important ways. The first is they're time dependent because in the short run, Fluctuations are positively serially correlated. In the long run, they're negatively serially right. correlated. So the long run variances are different than the short run variances. And I think there we care about the long run or permanent impairment of capital. Absolutely. Second thing is variances don't distinguish between losses and gains. And what you care about is yeah, the losses. upper tail, which dominates the variance, you care about the downside. So I think the proper definition is, again, the Graham and Dodd definition. You're worried about permanent impairment of capital. And I think there, there are some principles that I think we have in this edition of the book good answers to. And there are things that you and your tenure here are, are issues that you're going to have to address and problems right. with. Right. I think the way to start is that the easiest way to permanently impair capital is to pay a dollar for something that's worth 50 cents or not to sell something for a dollar when it's being offered when it's actually worth 50 cents. And that's really what margin of safety is all about. Right, right. So I think the fundamental tool of permanent impairment of capital management is making sure holding by holding, investment decision by investment decision, sell decision by sell decision, you're selling when there's no margin of safety, you're buying when there is a margin of safety, and you're holding when there's an adequate but not viable margin of safety. So I think that's the first step. Second thing is that you don't want to sell when you have to sell when you don't want to. Yes. Forced selling is permanent impairment of capital again. So you want companies to stay away from leverage and you want to stay away from leverage, unless there is essentially minimal chance that this leverage will impair the operations of your portfolio or your firm. And there are levels of leverage for companies like Nestle that have that characteristic. But in general, you want to be really careful for leverage. Then the problem, you do want to be diversified. You don't want to be a one-stock portfolio. But managing portfolio risk as opposed to individual stock risk is not something we have a good answer to. Right. I mean, you build a portfolio, you can sort of, I think there are three asset classes. There are real assets, natural resources, competitive businesses, real estate that do well in boom times, do badly in deflationary times. There are fixed income assets that do well in deflationary times, do badly in inflationary times. And then there are franchise businesses that do well in both. So certainly for your portfolio, you want to form an inventory of what your net exposure is from what you own in those terms. But then you got to manage that risk. And that I don't have a good answer to. And that's yeah. going to be your job. If you want to talk <laughs> well, about I think, it now, go ahead. But I think that's a problem. No, I will, I will say a couple that's of comments very way. briefly. One, one that I learned from you, which is, that we have uh, a risk management approach that is fully consistent with the process you described just a few minutes ago. That to some extent, risks are situational. They depend on whether you're approaching 
uh, the valuation through an asset value earnings per value approach, in which case you have to ask yourself whether the, there's some hidden liability that may compromise the asset value, whether there's something that may render the business less sustainable than you uh, originally assumed. And of course, if you are doing uh, franchise investing, then the risk that you should be worried about is that the barrier to entry is compromised for some reason, whether perhaps because there's some technological innovation that allows an entrant to pattern around whatever technology the incumbent is using, or perhaps because of some regulatory uh, intervention that you know limits uh, the ability of the company to price, uh, you know, you know, with a monopoly price. Uh, so that's one first consideration that you should uh, take into account when thinking about risks. The other one is the one you mentioned that what we care about is a permanent impairment of capital, and of course that immediately suggests. Um, kind of uh, that the shock that you worry about is one that is permanent in nature, that it permanently affects uh, the business operations of the firm. And again, you can you can think of many shocks that uh, fall into this category. But if you, what you're contemplating is a transient shock, a business cycle type of shock, perhaps some of disruption associated with some value chain for X or Y reason, then you really have to look at the um, you know the you know the the, the the business operations how they run do they have leverage that can uh, you know compromise their ability to survive this temporary shock or do they have a lot of operational leverage do they have a lot of hidden leases that you don't know about or something some commitment of balance sheet that may compromise uh, the value of the equity so that's when the uh, temporary shock may be a sort of a source of concern and that's why many value investors of course stay away with businesses that have high operational or financial uh, leverage but if not if the shock is transitory and the company is free from these kind of leverage uh, considerations then of course you know your horizon should give you uh, enough protection and in fact you like these shocks because there are opportunities uh, to further buy and to invest more on those wonderful companies that you already have in your portfolio. And many of the returns of the great investors come precisely because in a way they go deeper into those companies they own in a downturn. Uh, so I think, and it's their ability to distinguish what is transient from permanent that allows them to do that with, uh, with conviction. So yes, a, a whole field of things to, to explore. So while Merit is carrying the questions, let me ask you the last question and that uh, to change a little bit from these deep methodological issues into, into you know, I think I would be chastised by many of our friends uh, attending this uh, um, talk. If I went, if I didn't ask you about where you think, uh, where do you think we are in this market, uh, which has elicited so much commentary in the financial press, are we getting ahead of the state of the economy? Do you have any general views uh, about that? And I know it's a little bit unfair to ask you such a oh, general question. No, I mean, question, it, that's, but... that's not unfair at all. I have no general views. I mean, yes, I have but... views of the <laughs> stupidities that are going on, but I have no general views about the market, except that I think it's a really dangerous level, that everybody seems to be minimizing very serious potential economic damage from the impairment of balance sheets as these economies uh, stay closed. But here's the thing. There are still opportunities out there. There are still local monopolies that are not well appreciated. And the one I've talked about for years, because it does indicate sort of what you're looking at is the difference between Deere, which has moved from a manufacturing focused company to a locally based service support company where they have local software, local financing, local secondhand markets, and local software that runs the run, runs these machines. And they therefore have local monopolies. They have geographies where they're 90% of the agricultural equipment and nobody's getting in those, uh, those markets. That that approach has been extraordinarily rewarding and by the way, extraordinarily robust. So in this crisis, deer is now up over $200 a share. Caterpillar, yeah. which doesn't understand that, is actually down since the beginning of the year. So I think it's literally, there are a lot of unexploited opportunities like that uh, that are out there if you understand particular industries 
and what these sort of franchised, focused, local approaches look like for good companies. Perfect. Um, that, 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 that's a perfect answer. I'm sure some of the questions are going to uh, further uh, ask you to explore this topic. So, Meredith, uh, why don't you shoot us a couple of questions, and we'll take it from there. We have an hour, a half an hour, to 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 fill some questions from the uh, from the audience. And thank you all very much again for for them. Terrific. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Tano. Bruce, you actually took my first question, which came in. Um, John Deere is having a good run, and what can we learn from this? I know you talked about uh, local monopolies, but can you expand on that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the thing is that John Deere has a return that, you know, is because agricultural equipment is a sector that's growing really rapidly where there is a big growth component to it that historically people have ignored because, uh, you know, it's a man, quote, manufacturing company. And it's increasingly non-cyclical. I mean, you look at what happened to them in 2000, where they had like a 3% reduction in demand and their profits went to zero. And you look at what's happened to them now, they're a non-competitive, uh, you know, collection of local market monopolies. And when their demand fell by a third, their profit margins only got cut in two. So the sustainable earnings are way above what traditional calculations uh, indicate. On the other hand, I will now say this. At this point, they are fully valued. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a lot of other crap out there that's way overvalued. Great. Exactly. So can I, can I add one thing, by the way, to this answer? You were mentioning Caterpillar. And one of the things that we discuss in class with the students is this wonderful attempt at entry into this business by Caterpillar. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a nice thing to uh, assess the existence of bias to entry. When you have a competitor trying to test the incumbent and try to steal the market away, fails, you learn a lot about why did it fail. It's, uh, you know, Caterpillar tried. Uh, they, if I remember correctly, they partnered up with the German farm equipment company class in marketing uh, a combine that they wanted to introduce and compete uh, for the US farm equipment business and they fell miserably. And it is precisely because of what Bruce was saying, because it's very difficult to reproduce this kind of local network of repair and service of these very complex pieces of equipment. So, so I, there's a method to, to, to verify the existence of bias to entry outside the financials that takes into account these industrial organization episodes. Yeah, and it's a really good question in another sense. One of the things that I think specialization benefits you in is you can not only identify the good smart companies, but you can identify the stupid companies. Yeah. And increasingly, I think people like Paul Halal are making a very good business of fixing the stupid companies. But yeah. you're not gonna do that if you're not an industry expert. So I think also go ahead and look for the caterpillars in the world and see what uh, can be done to fix them. So, uh, you know, Mary, if I saw a question so moving by- moving on to your comment. Yeah, go ahead, Mary, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, you, you have the floor. Let, let, yeah. I think Meredith got frozen. So, so let me ask let me ask this question, Bruce, because Meredith is having I think Meredith is right now having problems with her connection. There's a a, 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 a member of the audience who asked this question about activism. Uh, Frank Doyle asked this question about activism, and you brought up uh, Paul Hilal. So how, how do you think about activism and this wave of activism that we're seeing in some of uh, uh, you know corners of the market that were free from activism? And, uh, you know, do you think there's a future for the connection between value investing and activism? I, th I think there is such a thing as value activism. Yeah. And if you say value investing is about knowing what you're buying, value activism is knowing what you're doing. So before you ever go into a company to try and uh, change what they're doing, you better have a really good idea of what initiatives you're going to kill, what changes you're going to make in everyday processes, 
where the potential is to raise margins. And I think you're not going to be able to do that well unless you are either an expert in that industry, which I think is the best way to do it, because then when stocks are temporarily down, you can intervene. But also uh, that if you're going to try and be a generalist, you're going to spend at least a year learning about these industries. Right. So activists who say, you know, okay, I'm going to go in and say, give us the money and add value that way. I think they're not going to, A, be beneficial to the global economy, and B, they're not going to be as successful investors as industry-specialized activists who know exactly what they're doing. Mary? Great, thank you. Sorry about that. So do you think the emerging competitive advantages of growth type investments, like some of the FANGs, are likely to be shorter duration given the pace of change in technology and services? And how should modern value investors think about this? Okay, I think there are two points about that. One is yes, technologically advantages, technology advantages tend to go away. But remember, a lot of their advantages are not technological. So Facebook, it's a network effect. Exactly. And what it's going to take to displace Facebook is somebody else like the way Facebook displaced MySpace is going to have to come up with an alternative that moves everybody to the new platform. But yes, it's much shorter live. Now, there is another subtlety at work here, which is, remember, you want to buy what you know is valuable. Franchises that have lasted for a long time, where there have been a lot of attempts of failed entry, are franchises you can have confidence in and a sense that their fade rates are not four or five, six percent a year. Like a, it's, it's not a 16 year or 20 year half life. These tech franchises have not been around that long. I mean, the longest is really Google that becomes dominant in 2003, which is a 17 year history. Microsoft is a little older in the tooth, but where you don't have a long history, you've got to, you know, have a margin of safety for fade rates that account for lifetimes of 20 years, 50, 25 years, or 15 years. That's exactly right. So, and Bruce, can I ask you, can I jump in and that, uh, you know, I'm curious about your views on this. The regulatory risk, I mean, there's kind of constant chatter about uh, regulating big tech, uh, you know, and there's a tradition in the United States of regulating monopolies. Uh, so w w how, do you, how do you process this risk? How do you think about it? Okay. The one nice thing about antitrust interventions is it's always been a failure. It's never been a success. And the reason it's never been a success is that if you look at the sustainable monopolies, they're all rooted in economies of scale. So when you try and break them up, you lose the economies of scale. And the, especially when you break them up into localities, the local companies have the same local economies of scale and they make the same profits. The niche companies like Microsoft have the same, and they've been trying to break up Microsoft for years. They have the same local economies of scale in the core software and they just continue and continue to dominate the market. So against successful monopolies, antitrust intervention has always been a waste of time and it's likely to continue to be a waste of time. It will, of course, affect companies around the edges. I mean, Europeans will steal $5 billion every four years from the big tech companies individually, right. and that'll go on, but that's not gonna impair this tsunami of profits that they make. So you think it's only like having, a, at the margin that isn't yeah, But having said that, I mean, the problem is that they will do a lot of broad economic damage by intervening because they're going to go after companies. They may distract management somewhat, but I don't think that it's something that's going to cause companies individually to have their monopolies in there. We know yeah. that doesn't happen. It's going to be right. just a general deterioration in the business environment and business and management performance, which is not good for anybody. Right, well, I completely agree with this. I mean, it's actually one thing that is worth reading from time to time is some of these documents that are being put out to, by the Antitrust Division or Brussels on how are they thinking about the barriers to entry of some of these big tech companies. And it, it, you're absolutely right. It's very much on the margins. You look at it and says, well, you know, I can imagine this being regulated, not being efficient, 
It's not going to change the business model of this company. It will create some frictions here and there, but it's not affecting the bulk of the profitability of this company. I think you're spot on on that. Meredith? Great. Thank you. So, change switching gears just a little bit, Bruce. Um, the question is, what have you learned about human nature during the pandemic, and how would you apply it to investing going forward? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for oh, that. Now that's going to that's get him going. <laughs> I think that we've learned that there are no limits to organized human stupidity when it gets embedded in government action. So there are, I think, three basic facts about the pandemic that don't get widely uh, circulated that you really have to, when you think about managing the pandemic, confront. The first is, and it's a really minor league pandemic, so that if you look at the 1918 flu, it kills 40 to 60 million people, which is about 2% of the population at the time. If you look at the AIDS epidemic, it killed 32 million people so far. It's killing 700,000 a year currently. If you look at the present one, it's basically under a million and we've reacted in a crazy, crazy way. So that's the first thing that everybody is grossly exaggerated what's going on. The second thing is that and this really has to do with how you're gonna control it. This is a very infectious disease. But for most people, it's not that bad. So the most single most infectious disease, I assume everybody knows this, is the common cold. And nobody tries to control the common cold by shutting down the economy, both because it's so infectious that's gonna fail, which you know, right now at least 25% of the population in the affected markets has got it. And sometimes in areas of New York, it's as high as 50%. So you're not gonna control it in by tracing and in the conventional ways. So that's a waste of time. The third thing is that the population at risk is very, very focused. 50% of the deaths pretty much worldwide have been in nursing homes. It's sick old people. To give you an idea about how focused that population is, only about 2% of the US over 65 population, two to 3% is in nursing homes. So if you protected the nursing homes and let everybody else go about their business, you would reduce the death rates by 50% to start. And that's the first sensible control measure that you would think everybody would do. Second thing is that even then, it is sick old people at home who are vulnerable. So I'll give you the numbers for New York since nobody publicizes them. New York has had about 18 to 19,000 deaths at this point. About 8,000 of them have been people over 75 years of age. Of those 8,000, fewer than 10 have been people without serious pre-existing conditions. So it's sick old people who are vulnerable. Now, Again, it's easy to protect those people at home. They've got to stay home. They've got to be extremely careful when they leave home, that anybody who enters their home, just like anybody or anything that enters a nursing home, has to be very carefully monitored and disinfected. But if you do that, and again, this is a relatively small, non-productive fraction of the population, you can be Singapore. The thing about Singapore is that they have had 8,000 cases per million, and they've had five deaths per million. To extrapolate that to the United States, if we got down to five deaths per million, it would be 3,200 deaths per year, which is not that much worse than the common cold. A good flu season is 20,000 deaths. A bad flu season is about, 60, about 50 to 60,000 deaths. So everybody has gone crazy here. The shutdowns are insane. And I think that should teach everybody something about institutional embarrassment. Because I think what's happened at this point is all the governments who around the world, Europe especially, but the United States too, except maybe for some Asian countries like Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, have been in trouble because people have recognized that they're taking half everybody's income, 
They've been running this demographic Ponzi game to enable people to retire early, which is just going to give out. And so they're not going to get benefit and they're unhappy with governments and governments decided they were going to show just how important and how valuable they were by saving the world in this instance. And of course, like all governments, they fucked it up. And that's the lesson I've learned. Sorry about the language. That's okay. I think we're all grown ups here. Um, that, 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 you know, it's a mystery to me. Why, why don't we have more stratified uh, policies in place? Uh, stratified by age policy. It's a mystery. They're, they're, anyway, it's a, you know, I think when the story of this pandemic is told, I think this is a question that historians will ponder. Meredith, we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, we're going to do a big switch of gears, so sorry about this, but going back to margin of safety, you mentioned several times about being disciplined about margin of safety. How do you think about the optimal margin of safety? Okay, so I think that if you're doing Asset value, earnings power value, you're talking about a third to a half. And again, that'll be a good margin of safety because if you're doing your valuation as an expert in that market, that'll cover any errors or mistakes you're going to make in valuation. When you're doing it in returns, I think you want a minimum margin of safety at entry point of 4%. Now, if you think a cost of capital is 8% and you want a margin of safety of 4%, that means you want a return of 12. And that's essentially, by the way, the one third margin of safety in return space that people talk about in value space. But here's the thing. Returns are inherently less exactly calculated. So you might want in return space a 5 to 6% margin of safety before you get in, get involved in an investment. But I think 4%, certainly less than 4 but you don't want to do it for 1%, 2% extra. And Bruce, can I, can I ask you one, one question? You mentioned this before, but I think it's worth um, reiterating this point. It's a question that you and I ask all the time by the students and by you know, panelists and these conferences that we attend. The, the issue of selling, when is that you sell? You spoke briefly about this in the case of Deer. And, uh, you know, what is the criteria that we should be following uh, when selling our positions, when exiting our positions? Okay. So can you, can you elaborate a little yeah, on this? Okay, again, when you're talking about sort of fixed income arbitrage opportunities, when you're talking about competitive businesses, competitive assets, and so on, Simply when it starts to get near to, like within 5% of or definitely above uh, your intrinsic value estimate, you're going to- The gonna, uninspired value, for instance. Yeah, you're going yeah, to you're gonna, you're gonna want to sell out slowly, probably, because we know that price movements are positively serially correlated and you probably want to take advantage of that. But you want to start probably somewhere around 5 to 10% below your intrinsic value and continue uh, you know, until maybe 20% above intrinsic value. The problem with the franchise businesses is that you can't pick a price at which to sell. And the return calculation is very insensitive to changes in the price. Because remember, the return you're using is a book benchmark return based on the assumption that price and intrinsic value are so the really hard thing to do for franchise businesses is to sell discipline. And there's just no good rule. And I think what you've got to do is exactly what we talked about with margin of safety as a risk management tool. If you're risk averse, you're going to sell the moment the margin of safety and returns gets down to 2%. If you're willing, you think you're fully diversified, that this is a diversifiable risk, a small part of a portfolio, it's like you got a 30 stock or a 20 stock portfolio, then you may be willing to go all the way till, you know, the margin of safety and returns is zero. But that's going to be a very inexact science. I mean, I, the, way I would do, the way I would do it actually is, again, relying on what you know. I think you don't want to have much more than two thirds of your return be non-cash or growth return. When the returns get to be that dependent on the future 
for my level of risk aversion, I'd get rid of it. So again, you could drive the policy by the cash return. And that is because the cash return is what's most measurable, I think the best way to do it. But it's really hard to do. That's not a problem that going to return solves for you. And I think it's significant that when you talk to good investors, they implicitly understand that it's the sell discipline that's the toughest discipline and the most arbitrary. Right, right. And that's a really good question, like all these questions. Yeah. May? Yeah. So, Bruce, going back to your point of specialization, what should people keep in mind when investing in international markets and does fun the fundamental approach apply globally? Okay. I think there are only two ways to do global. One is to pick an industry or two industries or three industries and do them on a global basis. And that means they've got to be industries that can't be real estate where there's a big, big local component. So I think that if you're going to do global in that way, it's going to be on focused industries that are global industries like agricultural equipment, where there are three big global competitors, you know, Agco, uh, Kubota, and Deere. Same with Caterpillar and uh, the construction equipment. So that's one way I think to do it. The other way to do it is you just got to pick a local market. And these, there'll be a lot of small and medium sized companies in that market that, you know, you can specialize in. You want to, might want to start out by doing industries that are big or important in those markets. But I don't think you can do un-industry focused global investing. Great. Can I add one point about this that I always think that is a little bit underappreciated, you know, which is, you know, if you're going to go global and international and you do what Bruce is suggesting of specialize, specializing in a particular industry, what is interesting is that, you know, industries across, you know, not all countries, all markets move at the same time. So you can learn very valuable lessons about the development of a particular industry in one market that you can export to another market and, uh, and lever that knowledge uh, in that new market because you know that it's going to follow very similar patterns and it's simply because economics is the same here and in the rest of the world. So kind of the logic of many of these changes of the adoption of particular technologies of particular consumer patterns and consumer habits kind of repeat themselves uh, on many different markets uh, at different points in time. So yeah, could I amplify that point? Because I think this is also an important point about specialization. No. You are going to do active research. You are actually going to go out and collect data that ideally you are or you and a small number of other people have access to without breaking the law. Do that, you've got to do it in a very focused way. Yeah. Do it in a focused way. You've got to understand what the critical assumptions are in your evaluation. And that may be different in different markets, just as Kano talked about. So also, the specialization is really going to help you focus your active research. If Absolutely. you are just, if you have a checklist that you do in every country, that's not going to give you, it's not going to put you on the right side of the trade. And if that's the case, and that's the way you do your global investing, you're going to be insufficiently specialized. And it's not going to work well. We have one time for one more question. We have time for one more, and I we've gotten a similar question over and over, and I thought, Tano, as you've taught with online things, it's best to end on something sensational. So, Bruce, a lot of people want to know, what are your feelings about Amazon these days? <laughs> okay. I mean, everybody should know that I've lost – that short is closed, by the way, so that I've learned from my own mistake. I, I'm not going to say the number in this big audience, but I assure everybody that I lost more money in Amazon than they, most of you will ever make in your lives. So I have that behind me. I, I think I've learned two things. I think one is that I've learned that I didn't truly understand the way Amazon works and the degree of customer captivity. And I think they've been better at doing auxiliary enterprises, advertising, yeah. 
and specialized uh, or increasingly specialized cloud computing, which I hadn't, uh, you know, I thought of them as the way everybody thought of them, as the everything store, which is still mostly an unprofitable enterprise. But see, I think that uh, Jeff Bezos understands his business better than I gave him credit for. On the other hand, I am not going to buy it at this price. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, for this wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, first uh, Royal Mary lecture. I want to thank uh, uh, Dima Glass for introducing the event uh, and all of you for attending it. Uh, we'll return next year with a second Royal Mary lecture. This is the way we intend to start uh, the academic year. Uh, and uh, we hope to uh, see you uh, then. Uh, remember, the second edition of the book is coming uh, out uh, 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 early October, if I'm not mistaken. We have many events coming our way. Uh, we are, you know, uh, still to a large extent remote on many of our events, but uh, we're going to be as active as ever. I believe uh, the second or the fifth season, the fourth season of the podcast will be out uh, in September and we'll have uh, a wonderful set of speakers and interviewees, as always, in the podcast. Can I just say one so, last thing about the podcast? Uh, yeah, go for questions it, Questions have been terrific. So oh, thank you. when we do it in the future, we want you to come back and ask the same quality questions. Okay. In the audience, <laughs> thank and on Tano's part. So just remember. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce. And with that, uh, I bid you all farewell. Stay safe. And we'll see you soon. Thank you again.